Amen. Good morning. It's great to see you this morning. Does anybody think they're at the nine o'clock service? <laughs> Good work with the clocks. I, um, I got here this morning about a little before 8.30, and uh, I ch- ch- checked and double-checked and triple-checked my clocks and alarms last night. Um, and still, when I pulled in the parking lot, I breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> Oh, um, I made it. I'm, I'm not late. I'm early. Uh, but good on all of you for uh, getting the clock thing figured out. If you have your Bibles, you can uh, open them to Hebrews chapter 3. We'll be uh, looking at verses 12 through 14 this morning. Uh, we've been going through Hebrews as a church for uh, most of the year, and uh, I really like the book of Hebrews. It's uh, one of my favorite books, mostly because the book just keeps drilling in on the question, who is Jesus? Right? And, uh, and over and over, um, the book asks, is Jesus the Messiah? How is Jesus the Messiah? How did he fulfill uh, what the Old Testament prophesied? Um, I meet with a teaching team each week, and, uh, and, and we discuss kind of what's coming up. Usually for Gary, this week it was for me. I got to ask a lot of questions. But um, one of the guys, Jim, who, who comes to the group, keeps reminding us, guys, this was written to Hebrews, to, to Jewish Christians, who were asking the question, Does Jesus, is Jesus the Messiah we've been waiting for? You know, he keeps bringing us back to that. And over and over you see the author answer that question. Yes, Jesus is greater than the angels. Yes, Jesus is greater than Moses. Yes, Jesus is the greater rest, the greater tabernacle, the greater sacrifice, the greater prophet, priest, king. He's the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament was, was looking forward to, right? And it's like every week we get to come and just hear again and again from one perspective after another, who is Jesus and what, what has he accomplished? And Hebrews will do that. And if you, if you want a, a great experience, um, if you can, find, carve out some time. Uh, find a, a way to get alone, away from the noise or the kids or the distractions and read, just read, like read over the book of Hebrews. Like it's good to study verses, you know, but step back and read the whole thing sometime. And you just hear the author pouring out one after another after another. He's the one you've been waiting for. He's the one you're looking for. He's the fulfillment. It's Jesus. You know, and so I love that. But today, it's kind of like the the author almost stops his train of thought um, to do some application. Like, so what do we do with this idea that Jesus is the the Messiah we've been waiting for? And so we get to this topic, and the author's going to talk about sin. And so it's my job today to sort of unpack this um, this idea of sin and how, how what Jesus has accomplished addresses our sin. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Um, if you're tracking with me, you can read along Hebrews 3, 12 through 14. I'll read it and we'll pray and get started. Hebrews 3, verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. You pray with me. Father, we thank you for this morning. I thank you for this church. Uh, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the chance to um, unpack this and look at it. And I pray, Lord, that you would um, speak to me as I speak, and that you would speak to everyone in this room uh, through your word, that we would have open ears, an open heart that we would not um, stiffen up or reject what you want to teach us, but that we would be um, a willing audience and and participant and that we would look at what Jesus has accomplished and see the great hope of the cross. Spirit of God, I pray that you would fill this room with your presence, that, that this would not just be information, it would be formative, it would be transformative, that our hearts would be softened and, and that we would grow in our knowledge and love of you as we learn more about what you've accomplished for us and in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, I I just want to look at this one verse at a time uh, under four headings. We'll look at the nature of sin and then sort of as a subset, the foundation of belief. So what is sin and how is belief related to sin? That's verse 12. And then uh, our defense, our daily defense is what I called it for verse 13 and verse 14, our ultimate hope. So first... um, The nature of sin. What does this passage teach us about sin? See to it, brothers, I'm in verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. And that word sinful, it probably in some of your translations is translated um, evil. 
But uh, Craig, who also is, uh, comes with a teaching team, uh, he didn't make it this week, but he sent a text about this word that was really helpful to me. He said, uh, Craig's always diving into the Greek, you know, the original language, and he's, he's pretty well educated in that way, and he always has some, some insight into a passage that I would never see without his help. And he said, this word evil... Um, there are lots of words that are translated evil or sinful. This one in particular has to do with a gradual drifting away, like a gradual change. He said, kind of like a frog in a kettle analogy. You know, if you put a frog in cold water and you start to turn up the heat, apparently the frog will never, it'll never try to get out. It doesn't realize it's about to be boiled alive because the change is so gradual. And he said, this word is kind of like that. It's this idea that, that the sin in our, in our life um, it gradually takes us away from God. It, it moves us in small, tiny, incremental steps so that you don't even really see a difference in a day or a week or a month or a year, uh, that, that you just gradually drift. And when Gary was commenting on this verse, he said, he said yeah, it's, it's kind of like if you're trying to get you know, across the room and you're just off by one or two degrees. It's no big deal if you're just going to the back of the room. You'll get there within a foot or two of where you were trying to go. But if you're going across the country, you know, 3,000 miles and you're off by a couple degrees, and you could end up in Washington when you're trying to get to California, right? It, that, that that's how sin works, that over the long haul, the author is saying here, there's this gradual moving away from God. And the, Bible's, the Bible talks about this in a lot of different ways. Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 5, he talks about how, how sin is, is really, it's small, it's hidden, it hides itself, but if you, if, if, he says, look, if, if you have hatred in your heart, you're already guilty of murder. I mean, he's essentially making the point that, look, murder doesn't start with blood on your hands. It doesn't start there. It starts with a thought. It starts with a, a snub or an irritation or a bitterness that grows into murder. Like over a long time, it, it develops, it grows, it transforms. And he says adultery doesn't start in the bedroom. You know, adultery starts with a look, with a glance, with a thought. That the, the seed of adultery, that if there's lust in your heart, he says you're already guilty of the sin of adultery. Not that you've committed adultery or that you necessarily even will, but that the sin, the, the whole sin is right there and it's hidden. It's small. It's in your heart. And the thing about sin, the Bible makes this point over and over, is that it hides itself. Sin is hard to see in yourself. So there's this, there's this story in Genesis 4. Cain and his brother Abel, you might be familiar. Abel made a sacrifice to God that God was pleased with, and Cain was jealous of Abel. And he started to nurture this, this anger, this irritation, this jealousy toward his brother. And God came to Cain and said, Cain, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. And I remember a sermon I heard a long time ago on that, on that verse, and the, the pastor compared sin to his cat. He said, I have a cat at home, and it's... it's really lazy. It lays around. It doesn't do much. But if I get out one toy that has a mouse on a string and I dangle it on the floor, it's like suddenly the cat is it's like back in the jungle. And it gets down on the floor and it gets low to the ground. It crouches. It hides itself. And it moves very, very slowly so that it's not threatening. So you don't realize what's happening until it pounces. right? And he said, look, this is what sin does this is how sin works. God says sin is crouching. It makes itself small. It makes itself seem like it's not that big a deal. Like, I got this under control. I know how far I'm going to take this and no further. I can handle this. It's not, it's not a big deal, right? But look where sin leads. At the end of verse 12, it, you turn away from the living God. That the wages of sin is death. And the Bible is very consistent on this that sin always leads to death, that every sin always leads to death, that all sin always leads to death. And so we, we think we can manage the sin in our heart, but if you could see it for what it is, you would know that it's crouching. Man, we're so good at sort of avoiding the sin in our own heart, not seeing what's in here, right? Like, if, if I tell you a lie, to me, I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm just twisting, I'm just exaggerating, I'm just twisting the truth a little bit. It's probably better that you didn't know the part that I left out. You know, I have my reasons. But man, if you tell me a lie, you're a liar, right? I mean, 
Because we, we judge everyone else by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions, right? We, we knew what we meant to do or what we meant to say. Sin hides itself. It's, it's small. And when I have a fight with my wife, you know what's in the back of my head? This is your fault. <laughs> I mean, this is at least 90% your fault. If you could see your problem here, then we, we could fix this, you know? But I guarantee if you ask her, her math's a little different, right? <laughs> because it's easy to see the sin in someone else, but it is, it is incredibly difficult to see the sin in your own heart. And guys, everybody's doing this. You don't have to be in the church to be doing this. Look at our country right now. We're so polarized. And the right is screaming at the left, you are trashing our country with your, your liberal agendas and your abortion and your homosexuality, and it's, it's ripping apart the fabric of our nation. And the left is over there screaming, you, are, you and the right are destroying our country with your bigotry and your sexism and your racism and your corporate greed running rampant. It's someone else's fault. They're the ones that are messing it up. They're the ones that are tearing it up, not me. And the folks outside the church, they look at us and they say, you guys are judgmental and hypocritical and bigoted and racist. If we could do away with organized religion, maybe we could get somewhere in this country. The folks in the church are looking outside going, it's the sex, drugs, and rock and roll that is ripping this country apart. It's the sinners out there, right? We all do it. We all do it. We hide from the sin in our own heart, sin is crouching in your own heart. Can you see it? Can you see the patterns enough to at least say, yeah, this might be me. I might have sin in my heart that I'm really not looking very closely at. That's why the start of this verse is see to it. Some of your translations say, watch out, be careful that you don't have sin growing in your heart because it's not obvious to you. And unless you unless you spend time looking for it, unless you spend time praying about it, unless you listen to the Lord, unless you have friends who will speak to you, you will miss the sin that is growing in your heart, that is crouching in your heart, that will lead to death unless it is dealt with, unless you repent of it and turn to the Lord. And sometimes, sometimes in his mercy, the Lord reveals the sin in our heart. Sometimes in his mercy, the spirit of God comes into our life and convicts us of sin and shows us what's really there. And it is a frightening experience to have God reveal to you how unfit you are for him. He did it several times in the Bible. And you can read about it. Isaiah and Peter are the two that I, I think about often. They, they become aware of their sin and everything suddenly feels threatening. But it is a great and severe mercy of God when he reveals the sin in your heart because he sees it for what it is and he knows it will lead to your death and he reveals your sin to you because he loves you and he wants you to be freed from it like we just sang about. So number two, what's the foundation of belief? See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. So what's this connection between sin and unbelief? He does not say, hey, see to it, watch out that you don't sin. He says, watch out that you don't have a sinful, unbelieving heart. And there's something to do here with the belief in our heart and sin. And so what's he talking about? Let's, let's unpack that a little bit. <clears throat> I think in general, we tend to think of sin as something that's out here. Right? We think of sin as something that, that we do, rules that we break or rules that we fail to keep. They're, they're transgressions, there's things we do, and that's what sin is. Right, But when Jesus talks about sin, he frequently uses analogies like this. He says, he says you're like a tree, and a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. And he basically says, look, there's no, there's no reason to take bad fruit and try to dress it up. You can't like airbrush a rotten apple and make it good again. If, if you want good fruit, you need to fix the tree. You need to dig around the roots. You need to fertilize. You need to water it. You need to get the tree back to health, and then the fruit that it produces will be good. Jesus is constantly talking like that. He tells the Pharisees, look, you think that the food you eat makes you unclean, but it, it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth, because out of the, out of the, mouth, the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
He says, what comes out of your heart is what makes you unclean. It's the sin in your heart that makes you unclean. And so what is this all about? This, to me, is one of the most helpful sort of distinctions um, that, I, that I can make. And I've heard this, I heard this a lot before it started to sink in. And so I ask you to be patient because I'm going to say it a couple different ways, a, a couple different times, because I really want you to understand this. And that is the difference between what I'm going to call religion and the gospel. And, and religion is this idea that the way, the way we get to God is we start on the outside, we dress up the fruit, right? We, we clean up our act, we work at it, we develop good habits, we read our Bible, we pray, we do the things we have to do to get from here to there, we work our way to God. But the gospel says no, The way to God is he comes to us. He comes into our mess. He takes our sin and our problems upon himself and he dies in our place and he makes us right with him. He makes us acceptable to him. That happens first and obedience is a response to that. And sometimes when you first hear that, it sounds like you're kind of splitting hairs. I want you to know that I I think this is... This makes all the difference in the world. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I think this makes all of the difference in the world. Every religion is outside in. Every religion has a destination I want to get to and a way to get there. Every one. Whether it's God or Valhalla or enlightenment or Allah, there is always a destination, a a place we want to get and a way to get there. And the way you get there is you do the prescribed steps. You do the things. You keep the rules. You do the the sacrifices, the oblations, whatever you need, whatever that religion prescribes, that's how you get there. And listen, all your life, you have been set up for this. I mean, when you were a kid, how did you please your mom and dad? You're, you're a good little boy or a good little girl, and that's what makes mom and dad happy, right? And then we go to school, and how do you, how do you get good grades? You've got to work at it. You've got to study. You've got you to earn it. And then you've got to take the test, and you've got to pass the test, and then you get the A. Right? And, and when you get to the workplace, how do you get a good job? You work at it, man. You work your butt off. You stay late. You, do the, you go the extra mile, and, and you get the promotion, and you make the more money, and that's, how, that's the road to success. And all your life, all your experience has been based on that form of evaluation, that form of progression in life. But if you take what you've learned from life and bring it to Christianity, you completely miss the point. That the gospel is not about getting you from here to there by a prescription, by a set of rules, by a bunch of steps. The gospel is about saying, I can't get there from here. I can't earn from God the thing I need, the thing I most want. But he has come into our life and taken our sin on himself and and died in our place to already make us right with him. And do you understand what a difference that makes, man? If, If you are motivated by a religious framework, then when, when you're doing well, like when you're kind of keeping the rules, when you're doing pretty good, you will look at people who aren't trying as hard as you and you'll look down on them and, and you'll feel self-righteous. You'll feel like, yeah, I got this together. And then when you fail, you'll be utterly devastated, feel like God wants nothing to do with me. I mean, ask me how I know. And then, and then, you know, when suffering comes into your life, you'll feel like, what's the deal, God? I've been holding up my end of this bargain. Why aren't you doing your job? And he feels like he's alienated from you. But man, when the gospel comes into your life, you go, no, I'm a sinner. I can't look at another sinner and say, look down on you. I go, I know exactly where you are. Let me introduce you to the one who's come into my mess and saved me. And when we fail, I mean, it, it, It stinks to grieve the heart of God and to fail and mess up our life, but it doesn't mean the relationship is broken. We know we can repent, and he is instantly forgiving and with us and loves us in the midst of our sin. And when suffering comes into your life, and if if you're focused on the gospel, you know the goodness of God as as a foundation of your heart. And so suffering comes into your life, and it's not that suffering doesn't hurt. It's not that you don't hate suffering. But in the midst of suffering now, you say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I know that the best place to be in the midst of the storm is right next to you, right? I mean, that's gospel-centered living. But so often, so quickly, we fall back into this mindset that, man, God's not real happy with me today. He doesn't really like what I've been up to today. 
Let me, let me tie this together in the book of Hebrews, because we started out in chapter 1, and Gary spent three or four weeks in that very first section of Hebrews. And the whole point of the very first section of Hebrews is that God speaks. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, In the past, God has spoken. And it goes through the ways God spoke, through the law, through the prophets, through the Old Testament. It says, But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, that, that the revelation of God has now come completely in one person, Jesus Christ, right? And the question is, well, so what did, what did he say? Like, what did, what did Jesus communicate? That ought to be the next line, right? And guess what comes in verse 3? After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. That when, when Jesus comes to fully communicate, to fully disclose who God is, what did he do? He went to the cross and he died in our place. This is the speaking God. This is the revelation, the voice, the language of God. And Hebrews 7 says, I mean, Hebrews 3, 7, right before this passage says, today, if you hear his voice, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Like, do you hear that? Like he's talking about, this is the voice of God. This is what he's done. If you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart. And when you live in a religious framework, uh, it is, I know because it's, it's the natural inclination of my heart, and I feel like I probably lived that way for most of my life. I mean, before really understanding what the gospel actually means, I kind of went, yeah, yeah, the cross kind of is my path to heaven, right? That's going to get me through the door. But I, I know the real deal is I got to work at this thing, right? And folks, I'm not saying there's no place for effort. There's no place for will. I'm saying that if, if your obedience is motivated by fear and anxiety before God, you do not understand the gospel. Until you experience obedience that is rooted in joy and gratitude and wonder and awe at what has been done on your behalf, you haven't tasted the cross, you don't understand the gospel, and, and I want you to. It is a totally different way of thinking about what really matters. I'll give you a quick story. Uh, about four or five years ago, I was um, over at uh, Orange Leaf, which is... Uh, corner of 7 and 14 in Columbiana, and they have, a, they have a big chess set, like big pieces like this big, and, and it's outdoor. And, uh, and my daughter was with me, and we were, I was teaching her how to play chess, you know, how, what each piece does and how to move. And, and she was trying to understand. I was probably way too ambitious for a dad with a daughter at that age. I don't know. But I, I would make a move, and then I would come over and tell her, like, if I, you know, I would move this way. So essentially, I was playing myself in a game of chess. And at, and at one point... I took my piece and I took her pawn. And I said, there, I just took your pawn. And, and I could see the sort of devastation creeping in. And then the lips started to quiver, you know, and then tears started to well up. And then, oh, the floodgates broke. And, oh, and, you know, if any of you have played chess, you know that, like, even in a great chess match, there's only a few, a handful of pieces left on the board at the end of the game. That The point is not to save your pieces, it's to save your king, right? And... A good dad would have gently explained that to their daughter. <laughs> um, but I was irritated, and people were starting to notice that my daughter was crying, and I think I said something like, listen, if you can't lose one piece without crying and losing it, then you're probably not ready for this game. And I walked, walked off the, you know, the chessboard and over to the park bench and sat down like this. <laughs> Poor child. And she has to live with me. <laughs> she stood in the middle of the chessboard sobbing, and now she's devastated that her pawn has been taken and that her dad no longer seems to love her. And, <laughs> and she stood there for probably 30 seconds like this. And then she looked up, and you know, tears are still coming, and she looked at me and looked. And I didn't know what she was going to do, but she turned to me, and she walked over, I'm sitting, you know, on the bench. And she walked over and just sat down on my lap and wrapped her arms around my neck and squeezed. <laughs> and I don't know how many of you have daughters, guys. Um, if you've had daughters or if you're going to have a daughter, they do something to your heart that no one else can do, right? I mean, I remember just being so devastated by that. And I, I thought, I never, ever want to do that again. I never ever want to communicate to my little girl that I only love her when she's doing the things I think she should do. 
And, uh, and when she doesn't, she gets the cold shoulder, you know? But while I was sitting there now hugging my daughter, um, it was one of those cool times when God kind of whispered in my ear, you think, you think you're a better dad than me? Do you think I'm like that? Do you really think I'm sitting on the park bench like this while you struggle? I mean, do you? Do you, do you think that? I mean, because I do sometimes, right? I have this idea of God that when I mess up, he's just like, are you kidding me again? Like, how many times are we going to do this, Joe? Like, he's just like fed up that the best I can hope for is like mildly irritated. And that is not God. Do you know that's the voice of hell? When he says, watch out for unbelief, you need to hear it. Watch out for unbelief. Watch out that you don't fall into thinking about a God who has nothing to do with the cross because the cross demonstrates to us without any question that you are his delight. He loves you. And not only that, but the cross makes you. It makes you acceptable to him. So when you don't feel acceptable, you look at the cross and you say, I don't care how I feel. I know the truth. The cross says, I'm acceptable. I'm made right with God. I'm his delight. I'm his son. And that is the engine of the gospel. Watch out that you don't have a sinful, unbelieving heart. And it turns away from the living God. So verse 13, our daily defense. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Encourage one another daily. This word encourage, I mean, it has to do with instructing, teaching. It's, um, it's basically tell each other the truth. <laughs> Right? Remind each other the truth. Say it every day. There is an urgency here. As long as it is called today, there, we, can't be, we can't be ho-hum about that. I mean, we need to know that you will drift. You will, you will not see the truth unless somebody is in your life reminding you, unless you're in their life reminding them. One of my favorite um, stories is from the Chronicles of Narnia. It's called The Silver Chair. And uh, it's, it's about a prince who is uh, the, the prince of Narnia, gets kidnapped um, by a witch and taken to her, her realm underground called the Underworld. And so this wicked witch has the, the Prince of Narnia in, a, in an enchantment where he doesn't know that he's the Prince of Narnia. And so he actually thinks he's the Prince of the Underworld and he serves her every day for uh, most of the day except for three hours at night. His, his memory comes back and he can remember, wait, I'm the Prince of Narnia. What am I doing here? I, where's the sky? Where's the trees? What, how have I been forgetting that I'm the Prince of Narnia? But so every night before midnight, they tie him, they, they lash him to the silver chair. And that way, when he goes through this memory, he can't do anything. He's tied to the chair. And then when the, uh, when the enchantment returns and he can't remember, they, they take the, the, the lashes off and he can come out of the chair and be the prince again of the underworld, right? So, so he goes through this for like 10 years. Well, the story's about... Two little kids and a marsh wiggle, which is like a, like a frog man uh, in the story, that go on a, a hunt for the Prince of Narnia. And they make their way into the underworld and they, they find the prince and they, they let him out of the chair and they destroy the chair and the enchantment's broken and they're, they're heading to freedom and then they meet the queen, the, the witch, the queen of the underworld. And, but she's beautiful and she's soft-spoken and she stops him and she says, Where, why are you leaving? you're more than welcome to stay. And they're a little bit confused because they now see very clearly what's going on. And then she, she takes something and she throws it in the fire and, and makes this sort of sweet smell. And she begins to work the enchantment again. And she says, oh, that's silly. There's no overworld. This world is all there is. You know that. The underworld is all there is. You've, you've been here a very long time. Why would, you, why would you even think you could leave? And she starts to work this enchantment. And after a while, they're starting to go, yeah, she's right. That's that was just a dream. I know now. But, but the marsh wiggle, he has this moment of clarity and he, he musters all of his strength that he can and he walks across the room and he takes his like duck foot <laughs> and he stamps right in the middle of the fire and it puts out the fire and stops the enchantment and fills the room with the smell of burnt marsh wiggle, which is apparently unpleasant. And, and suddenly everyone's head is clear and they remember, oh, wait, <laughs> No, we're, we're Narnians. We're, 
I'm the prince of Narnia, and we've come to rescue him. And, and you know, it all becomes clear. And they, they, they fight the queen, and they defeat her, and they make it out to overworld, and they all live happily ever after, right? And what C.S. Lewis is doing is he's describing the experience that is every one of ours in Christian living is that if, if you don't do anything, you will just slowly begin to believe that this is all there is. I mean, religion might help you feel better and, you know, maybe there's a heaven someday. And, but, you know, here and now, this is what we live for, right? This is the real deal. This is all that really matters. And, and if there is a God, well, he's either not very interested or he's disappointed because I haven't been doing the right. And we need people in our lives who encourage us daily, people who come into our life and they put their foot in the fire, right? They come into our life and they say, no, that's not true. You're not living according to what you know is true. You need to remember there is a God. There is a heaven. There is a hell. There is a cross that makes you right before God. Man, reframe your your mind. Rethink this and start living in accordance with what you know is true, right? Do you have people in your life that do that? And maybe more importantly, are you a person that does that in someone else's life? Because when we, when we exhort each other, not only does it help us keep our minds right, but when you exhort someone else, when you encourage someone else, when you take this truth to someone else, the cool thing is, you know, sometimes, sometimes you just kind of believe like it's foggy or something and you can't really keep, you don't even have it straight in your own head. But when you're able to get your eyes off your own problems and look at someone else and tell them, hey, the Lord loves you and he died for you, all of a sudden, it becomes clear to you, and it becomes clear to him or her, you know? And that's such a cool thing that happens in community. And what would happen, guys, if we were a church that's really good at that? What if we became a church that made it a regular, daily occurrence, that we, we are in community with each other, and we encourage each other daily with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? What kind of community would we be? What would that look like to the world around us? and encourage each other daily, as long as it is called today. And finally, uh, verse 14, our ultimate hope. We've come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. We've come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. You know, on uh, on the night before Jesus was crucified, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and, uh, and the Bible describes that night as, as really a, like the worst night of Jesus' life, that he was sweating drops of blood, that he was in agony to the point of death. I mean, this was, this was a, a horrific night for him because for Jesus, I mean, he knew it was coming and he's, he's looking ahead to what would be an unimaginable way to die, right, on a cross. But he also knows that that's, that's just the tip of it, that he's about to face the wrath of God for the sin of the world, that he's about to face a real turning away of the living God, a, that, that Jesus on the cross was going to bear the entire weight of all sin. And, and Jesus is facing this. Uh, I mean, maybe it's a mercy of God that we can't imagine what that's like. But, you know, Jesus asked a couple of his closest friends, three of the disciples, to come with him and pray with him. You remember that story? He, in, I mean, as far as I can tell, and I say it sort of cautiously and with reverence, but I, I think Jesus needed them. Like he needed companionship and he needed friendship in this darkest hour. And what, what he needed was someone to come with him and put their foot in the fire and say, I'm here, I'm praying with you. I might not understand, but I love you, I'm with you. And you know what the disciples did? They fell asleep. And, you know, by the way, there are people who think that these stories were made up um, after the fact to try to um, build the foundation of a religion that the disciples would then be, like, in charge of. This is one of the best pieces of evidence we have for the authenticity of this story. The, The disciples, if they made this up, would never put in the story that they fell asleep at his hour of greatest need. It's in there because it happened. I mean, this happened. Jesus was facing the cross and his disciples fell asleep. And you know what I would have done at that point? I'd have said, you know what, guys? I'm out. This is too hard and you guys don't even seem to care at all. 
But he goes to them and he woke them up and he said, well, you stay awake. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's tender with them. He's understanding. Stay awake with me. And he goes back and they fell asleep again. And, uh, and so he faced it alone. And the next time he woke him up, there's like, his whole attitude has changed. He wakes him and he says, wake up, the hour has come. Here comes my betrayer. And he marched straight into the storm. And here's Jesus, who, who just asked them to stay awake for a few hours because he knows that he's about to put his foot, not just his foot, he's about to cast himself into the fire for us. He's about to go way further than he has ever asked any of us to go on our behalf, right? And he did. He gave himself so that we can know without a doubt that we are forgiven and loved. His death makes us clean. He takes your sin on himself and makes you clean. And when you doubt that, when you feel the doubt creeping in, and you need to look at the cross. And one more thing about this, um, the end of this verse. We've come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. What's this about, this original conviction stuff? If a lot of people take this part of this verse and try to build an argument for or against what we call eternal security, right? Whether, whether you can or cannot lose your salvation. Can I get saved here and then do something that I lose and then I don't get to heaven? Uh, I don't think that's what this verse is about. There are places in the Bible that address that issue. And that would be a whole other sermon. I think this verse is talking about something very different because this verse is not, it's not giving us sort of a, a, a disconnected theology. This verse is addressed to Hebrew Christians who are in persecution, who are suffering right now. Let me ask you this to try to, try to um, help understand this verse. A lot of you have uh, sort of um, spectacular conversion stories. Or, or you know people who have spectacular conversion stories. My conversion story isn't that exciting. I, was, I don't even remember the first time I prayed a sinner's prayer. I was really young. But I've had some personally very meaningful sort of renewals in my life. So I, I can kind of identify. But when you meet someone with like a spe- spectacular, you know, I was, a, I was addicted to drugs. I was in prison. I was, you know, and, and I met the Lord and uh, my chains fell off. I've been set free, you know, that kind of spectacular story. And if you have that or if you know people like that, can you remember what that was like? Can can you remember what it was like to feel the burden, the weight of shame and sin on your heart like it's palpable, like it is so thick and heavy and it's always in the background and often in the foreground and you feel like you can never make progress and, and, and it is just hard and then you come to Jesus and you hear the gospel and you say, oh my, you will forgive and accept me now like this? Yes. And you feel all of it just fall away, right? Just freedom, like freedom like you can't imagine. I mean, I hope there's someone in this room who's going, yeah, I remember that. I know what that's like. Listen, that is not. that should never be A one-time experience that happens once in our life and then from now on we're sort of on our own. Like we have this idea that that salvation works this way. We we live as aliens and sinners, uh, you know, aliens to God and sinners. And then at some point the gospel breaks in and we sort of get a freebie, like a get out of jail free card. And now everything's clean. But from here on out, man, you got to work at it. Right? So... I remember when I was forgiven and saved, and now I got to put in the effort. I mean, the cross is still there. It's still part of the equation, but I got to work at this thing. Guys, will you listen to me? That is Satan's lie from the pit of hell. He would want nothing more than for you to think that you need to add to the cross of Jesus Christ. Because Paul says, the moment you begin to add qualifications to the cross, the moment you say, yeah, I'm saved, but I mean, if you don't read your Bible, man... Or I'm saved, but you better be sharing your faith. Or I'm saved, but if you're still doing those things, the moment you do that, Paul says, you've negated the cross. You've made the cross worthless. Listen, those things better happen in your life, but they better be a result of something deeper, not the way to get there. Do you understand the difference? One more point about this. Um, Some of you are in habitual sin. 
Like you go, yeah, that's great, man. But I mean, like when I walk out of here, I'll be doing that thing again an hour from now. And I don't know that I'll even make it to tonight. What do you have to say to that? You know, there's a place where Peter asked Jesus, and he was, Peter was kind of trying to go over the top. He said, Jesus, how, how many times should I forgive my brother? It's like, seven? And Jesus said, no, not seven, but 70 times seven. And he, I mean, in case anybody's wondering or doing the math, he doesn't mean like 490. <laughs> he means there should never be an end to your forgiveness, to the, the amount of times, the amount of of, of things you're willing to forgive, your heart should be conditioned to forgive every time. Now, do you think Jesus is giving Peter a command that is like greater than he's willing? You, guys, every time you turn, every time you repent, every time, you can't exhaust the grace of God. Come back to him. He will give you the grace for today, as long as it is called today. Now, you don't have to come back to God. I mean, we come back to him sort of with this idea that now everything has to change and I got to take the next 40 years of my life and commit purity and holiness. Man, nobody can do that. Nobody can bear that. Satan loves to make you think that as long as it is called today. Come to him today. Say, Lord, I don't know if I'll make it to this evening. I don't know if I'll get through tomorrow, but I want you and forgive me. And when you fail, when you fail again and again, keep going back. And I had a pastor friend who said to me one time when we were talking about this, he said, look, if you're walking across a parking lot and you slip and fall, you don't stand up and walk back to the beginning of the parking lot and then walk back across it. It's insane. But that's what we do in our Christian walk, right? We think we owe God some penance, some kind of, uh, and the cross covers your sin. You just need belief. Watch out that you don't have a sinful, unbelieving heart. Um, one more story, and I'll close with this. When I was in college, uh, the same pastor, his name's Dan, had a huge influence in my life. And I, I very vividly remember one story he told. And he said, uh, you know, he said, his son Jake is now in his mid-20s, but at the time he was like five years old or something. And he said, one night I was wrestling with Jake. We were just roughhousing on the carpet, you know, playing around, and, I, and he tripped, and I landed on him, and I kind of hurt him. I, I don't remember how he hurt him, but nothing serious, but he hurt him. And Jake, Jake got really um, kind of started to cry and was, was hurting a little bit, and Dan said, I'm sorry, buddy, I'm sorry, and tried to hug him, and Jake did this, like, telephone pull thing, just stiffened up, you know, like, let go of me kind of thing. He said, but there have been other days when I come home from work and I'm in really nice clothes, like a suit and tie, and, uh, and Jake's been playing outside all, all day, and he just is a mess, like little boys do, dirt and mud, and, and he says he comes running up the sidewalk, big arms, and Dan said, and I scoop him right up, and I hug him, and I say, hey, buddy, how was your day? And he said, he looked out at the crowd, and, he, and I remember this so vividly, he said, look at me, look at me. It is a lot easier to hug a dirty kid than it is to hug a stiff kid. And then he said, if you don't hear anything else today, hear this. It is not your sin that keeps you from God. The atonement of Christ on the cross has taken all of your sin. But stiffness, stiffness will kill your relationship with him every time. He said it twice. I remember vividly. He said, stiffness, stiffness will kill your relationship with him every time. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And it doesn't take anything. It doesn't take any ritual, any, any, any newfound commitment. Just drop it all and say, Lord, I accept what you've done for me. I believe you are who you said you are forgive me, <laughs> welcome me home. That's it. And you can make that public if you want. Come down here. You can do it in private. You can come talk to me or talk to a close friend. And, but just come. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel, this incredible, incredible news that we can be made whole, made free, made right with you right now without condition, without 
obligation and, and all the other stuff we pile into religion. Lord, help us. Help us to see the gospel simply for what it is, to see Jesus for who he is, to believe that you're bigger than sin, not by a little bit, by a lot, and to, to rest in you, to lean into you, to hope in you, anchor our hearts in you. Lord, let this church be a place where we hold that up to each other, where we hear it often and say it often, and it becomes part of the, the fabric of who we are. We thank you for the gospel. Thank you for all that you're doing here. And we pray your work in our hearts be done. In Jesus' name, amen.